Listening fill in the blanks. Let's start. The IQ test has been eclipsed in turn. Most people studying intelligence and creativity in the new millennium now prefer a broader definition, using a multifaceted approach where talents in many areas are recognized rather than purely concentrating on academic achievement. If we are therefore assuming that talented, creative or gifted individuals may need to be assessed across a range of abilities, does this mean intelligence can run in families as a genetic or inherited tendency? Mental dysfunction, such as schizophrenia, can. So is an efficient mental capacity passed on from parent to child? Obesity is a huge problem in many Western countries and one which now attracts considerable medical interest as researchers take up the challenge to find a cure for the common condition of being seriously overweight. However, rather than take responsibility for their weight, obese people have often sought solace in the excuse that they have a slow metabolism, a genetic hiccup which sentences more than half the Australian population, 63% of men and 47% of women, to a life of battling with their weight. The argument goes like this, it doesn't matter how little they eat, they gain weight because their bodies break down food and turn it into energy more slowly than those with a so-called normal metabolic rate. Using gas cookers or burning candles, for example, both result in indoor levels of carbon monoxide and particulate matter that are just as high as those to be found outside, amid heavy traffic. Overcrowded classrooms whose ventilation systems were designed for smaller numbers of children frequently contain levels of carbon dioxide that would be regarded as unacceptable on board a submarine. New car smell is the result of high levels of toxic chemicals, not cleanliness. Laser printers, computers, carpets and paints all contribute to the noxious indoor mix. The implications of indoor pollution for health are unclear. But before worrying about the problems caused by large-scale industry, it makes sense to consider the small-scale pollution at home and welcome international debate about this. In the late 1920s, the automobile tycoon, Henry Ford, had a vision. He believed in vertical integration that is, a supply chain of car parts and products united through his ownership. With his factories producing hundreds of thousands of cars, each of them needing rubber tires, Ford wanted his own source of rubber and resented dealing with the British plantation interests. He therefore decided to buy a huge tract of Amazonian rainforest, where he would transplant his American workers and lifestyle in order to make the largest rubber plantation on the planet. It would be called Fordlandia ambitious, grandiose, and doomed from the beginning. Aromatherapy and homeopathy were no better than placebos, with almost a half thinking the same of herbalism and spiritual thinking. Some of the comments we received were scathing, even though one in ten of our respondents had used homeopathy. Homeopathy and aromatherapy are scientifically nonsensical, said one molecular biologist from the University of Bristol. Dr. Romp Braun, a molecular biologist at the Medical Research Council Center at King's College, London, added, Homeopathy is a big scam and I am convinced that if someone sneaked into a homeopathic pharmacy and swapped labels, nobody would notice anything. Nonetheless, as information theorists, neuroscientists, and computer experts pool their talents, they are finding ways to get some lifelike intelligence from robots. One method renounces the linear, logical structure of conventional electronic circuits in favor of the messy, ad hoc arrangement of a real brain's neurons. These neural networks do not have to be programmed. They can teach themselves by a system of feedback signals that reinforce electrical pathways that produce correct responses, and conversely, wipe out connections that produced errors. Eventually the net wires itself into a system that can pronounce certain words or distinguish certain shapes. For the first time, linguists have put a price on language. 
To save a language from extinction isn't cheap, but more and more people are arguing that the alternative is the death of communities, there is nothing unusual about a single language dying. Communities have come and gone throughout history, and with them their language. But what is happening today is extraordinary, judged by the standards of the past. It is language extinction on a massive scale. According to the best estimates, there are some 6,000 languages in the world. Of these, about half are going to die out in the course of the next century, that's 3,000 languages in 1,200 months. On average, there is a language dying out somewhere in the world every two weeks or so. While events such as the deforestation of the Amazon jungle or the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl continue to receive high media exposure, as do acts of environmental sabotage, it must be remembered that not all pollution is on this grand scale. A large proportion of the world's pollution has its source much closer to home. The recent spillage of crude oil from an oil tanker accidentally discharging its cargo straight into Sydney Harbour not only caused serious damage to the harbour foreshores but also created severely toxic fumes which hung over the suburbs for days and left the angry residents wondering how such a disaster could have been allowed to happen. What do we mean by being talented or gifted? The most obvious way is to look at the work someone does and if they are capable of significant success, label them as talented. The purely quantitative root percentage definition looks not at individuals, but at simple percentages, such as the top 5% of the population, and labels them by definition as gifted. This definition has fallen from favor, eclipsed by the advent of IQ tests, favored by luminaries such as Professor Hans Ising where a series of written or verbal tests of general intelligence leads to a score of intelligence. 